Till I turn the clock Rolling around the bed I ain't seen the sun shine I don't know where I'm lost up in Bozo Bridge And I do the track When I started brewing, the craft brewing industry hadn't really taken off uh, to, to the point, but the, the Carter administration, they actually changed the laws in the United States we could actually homebrew legally, and that was in the late 70s. And that started kicking in with the early craft brewers. So I started more uh, homebrewing more often in the mid-80s, and by the end of the 80s I was convinced that maybe this should be a business I'd like to get into. And I started reading more about it, seeing more about craft brewers and people that started in their own, like, a, you know, with using old dairy equipment. So I was looking at ways to do that. And I talked to my wife about it, Minnie, and we started to travel around to these little breweries and check them out and see what they had going on. So I saw that and I saw the industry start to take off and I thought it'd be really cool to be able to get involved with that. In late 90, 1997, we bought this farm and it was such a cool space. I said, boy, if we're going to do it, it'd be awesome to do it here. 2004 started to come together and I, at that time I was in my late 40s and I said, you know, either I'm either going to do this or never do it and just had convinced many that it was worth trying um, and she's been behind me, you know, 100%. So things started to come together, you know, just took some doing and, and believing and hoping and, you know, and winging it in the end, you know. And here I am today making beer on a commercial basis. being able to make a variety of different beers, not just the same old lagers and stuff that we're typically accustomed to, like Budweiser or Coors or whatever, which they make a fine product, but there's so much more variety in it. I, I you know, respect for all brewers, and it's a, it's a, it's a labor-intensive industry to begin with, and you can have a lot, a lot of automation and stuff. We don't, we just have an old barn, and ours is pretty much handcrafted beer because we haven't gotten, all, don't have a lot of machinery and pumps and all this and that, but, you know, certainly that's, a, better, more intelligent, probably more efficient way to make the beer. My thing was to try to make some different beers with some different flavors and stuff because I had, I'd got a, exposed to that and to be able to make it from scratch was even more kind of made it more of an experimental thing, you know, the, little, the science behind it. And the, there's also an art to it too because it's like baking or cooking you can be, you know, if you make the recipe your own. So we're doing it that way and I'm kind of sticking with the farm theme since we're on a farm and we have the acreage to grow the product on. Um, we do grow some barley, some hops, and we're making a good percentage of our beers, more than 99.9% .9 of the breweries out there in the United States of America because there's not many breweries that do this or have the, the space or the time or people like Joel Hunter who's out there in the hop field who is a good friend, he's an agronomist for the Penn State Agricultural Extension Office and He's kind of been the, uh, you know, the lever behind us keeping it going. But I think it's, it's very gratifying because we make beer that we grow the stuff, we malt the barley, we process the hops, and we make beer out of it, and it's a good finished product. It's, I mean, it's the essence of doing stuff on the farm, and that's what we want to do. We want to try to push that, and I really believe it gives us an, a niche that no, not a lot of people can, can uh, fulfill. There certainly will be others, and there are other people doing this now. But it's we're kind of on the forefront of doing this, even though it's like kind of backwards. We're we're going backwards to go forwards, you know. And people want locally grown stuff, and they don't want to have a big carbon footprint. And you know, we're minimizing our carbon footprint, and we're growing locally. And you're growing a locally produced beer. I mean, there's it's you know it's they make great they grow great malts and pops all over the world, and you can make some spectacular beers with that. But to make it from what we have, it's pretty special, and we're 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 tweaking it. We're making a lot of different varieties of beer to to find out what works best with our ingredients. But so far, we've made it, every beer we've made, every recipe we've come up with has been drinkable, and <laughs> it's had alcohol in it. And um, you know, certainly there's fans of some of them, and 
some, some people don't like some of them, but they've all been beer in the end. And it's, uh, you know, I can't say enough about the fact that we were able to do that. And it's, it's few and far between that breweries that, especially of our size, can't, you know, it's a lot of labor and it's a lot of stuff. But I think it's, you know, the best thing we're doing and keeping with the theme. When we started this, it was Sprague Farm and Brew Works for a reason. We stressed the farm part and we're still carrying through with, I don't know if we had a mission statement, but that was kind of the theme when we started, you know, so it's uh, where we want to be right now. We started these when we started the brewery like seven years ago. We got these started. Mm -hmm. And it take, say it takes like three years for them to establish and really come to full fruition, you know, where they start to really produce a lot of product. Um, they'll grow in the wild, you know, they'll grow wherever and they'll grow along the ground. And, but they want to go up. If you go out there and look at them right now, you'll see where they start to grow. And they'll, they'll climb on themselves. They'll start wrapping around each other. That's what they want to do. They just start twirling around. But then when they hit a tree or a weed or anything, they'll climb. Uh, the big thing is to keep them, you, you have to have fairly well-drained soil, which we have nice gravelly soil here. It needs air and sunlight. And that's why this is elevated. It's on our best drained soil. And it's got a lot of sunlight. We had to move cut some trees out to get a little air movement through there and it needs adequate water it doesn't need you know to be drenched but it needs adequate water so we generally have enough water here throughout the year the barley itself is you know it's it's uh, not perennial you have to harvest it and replant it every year you know that the malting process means we have to put it in uh, let it germinate um, and we do that by putting in bulk tanks like when you have an old dairy bulk tank you have to soak with water let it hydrate do that several times, like drain it, hydrate it, and then put it, we put it on a uh, floor, it's called floor malting, and we actually turn it two to three times a day and wet it down so that it sprouts. And once it sprouts, it gets to a certain point, you have to stop the germination process and then you have to dry it. And uh, then you have to clean the, what's called the chits, which are the little roots that come off, and then it's ready to make beer. This is our mash time and our root kettle, that's the big hot liquor tank or storage tank over there, our mill. When you make beer, I kind of explained a little bit about it earlier, you're making it with barley, malted barley and hops and you can use other ingredients, but basically the malted barley, you have to break the husk of it up, so the mill is here to break the husk of the barley up, and it doesn't really, doesn't grind it, it just crunches it enough to open the hull up, the husk. So you mill it here, Put it into the mash tun, and the mash tun, what you're doing is adding hot water into the with the barley malt. And those hot the hot water reactivates enzymes which are created during the malting process. And the enzymes then break the starches and the beer down to simple fermentable sugars. And that's why we're trying to do is convert much of that starch to simple fermentable sugar if you can. So what you're gonna do next is rinse the sugary water out and collect it in our kettle there and boil it, and that actually sterilizes the beer and it concentrates the sugars. And your hops, for the most part, go in during the boil. Um, you can add hops late, but it's called dry hopping, and we add that into the uh, fermenter. A lot of different ways to do that. But, so boil it, um, add hops into it. You add bittering hops in the beginning and aroma flavor hops throughout the rest of the boil. You know, it just depends on the beer you're making. Um, so that's part of the recipe, just as the different malts you put in. We have crystal, and there's chocolate and black and there's all kinds of different varieties. Uh, then we have a cool and that's a heat exchanger and we simply run the hot beer through there and cool water, well water, and well water cools the beer from boiling down to like 60 degrees. We pump it through there, it goes down to the basement, we capture the water and there we use the water when they run for brewing or whatever. So we kind of conserve our water by doing that. So once it comes through there, we pump it downstairs to the fermenters and that's where we're going next. And you can see from the fermentation room in our kind of our packaging area. So and here is the fermentation room. We have to you know, keep the temperature down. We're, we're trying to make a compromise between making ales and lagers. So we keep the room about 58 degrees. And the lagers do okay at that temperature and ales will do all right. It's kind of like a compromise. Ales usually are fermenting more in the 60s, 
mid 60s and larger is a little lower than that, but because we have to try to do both in one room, most places have jacking tanks and they can control each individual tank. Well, we have, don't have that luxury, so we kind of came up with this system to make that work. But we use gravity feed out of the fermenters right into the kegs. And when we, we don't filter the beers I talked about before. And basically, if you get one of our kegs and shake it around, you get some yeast in the solution. But it's not bad for you, it's actually kind of beneficial because it's got feed right in it and a little protein. Um, you know, some people may not like the look of the beer. If you pull off the bottom of the keg, you know, it's like a big straw that goes down and pulls off the bottom. That initial pull will be the more yeasty beer, and as it, you know, pull to the bottom it starts to go down, all the beer is kind of clarified as you go down. So, a keg that you know, hasn't been clarified or filtered can be actually really fairly clear by the time you get to the end of it, you know. Um, but that's a little process we take the lagers out here and we secondary ferment them in our coolers at 37 degrees and the ales we put out here and they, they're okay at like 70 degrees so they'll be okay to secondary ferment in the keg. Beers are best to drink fresher mostly but people age beers. You can age them on berries, you can age them in fruit, you can age them in whiskey barrel but you know they don't, hot is a preservative and it keeps them uh, fresher longer so if you have a high hot beer it's going to be better for a longer time. But we try to serve our beer within a couple months. You know, it takes the ales we can have ready in about a month, and they're ready to drink. The lagers about six to eight weeks. And you can lager. Mostly our lagers get better the longer they set. But you know, we like to set them for about four to like six weeks, and they're ready to serve. And then we start pouring, but they actually get better. So that's our inventory of cakes that we have filled. We have some in the coolers, like our lagers in the cooler. Mm -hmm. um, that's our kind of our stock. This is our keg washer over here. And we wash the kegs here. We, you know, wash, rinse them, wash them with a hot caustic cleaner, then rinse them again. Well, that's our cleaner for the kegs. Say you might brew you, a beer, you know, half a dozen times mm -hmm. to the point where you're like, okay, this is what we want. This is the kind of flavor we want, and all. Right. So, and there's beers we brewed on the first. Uh, from the get-go that have been good and we try to replicate them and sometimes they change a little bit but it's really it's an ongoing process uh we we don't have a lot of controls in place here we try to make the beers the same and consistent but yeah. and i think they are but we don't have you know like a lot of the big brews have everything's temperature controlled and they have real good quality control which we are, are you know luke's brewing luke steadman's brewing for us minnie and myself and that's our quality control and our customers are also you know and i think you know, one of the things we're doing here is we're a community thing. You know, it's, it, a lot of people don't gather in community settings anymore, and we've given people an opportunity to do that. You know, there's beer involved, but it's more than that. People are out playing horseshoes, and they're, you know, in the summertime and throwing, playing corn toss or whatever you want to call it. You know, um, and they, we have tried to have music out here and events where we uh, do stuff for charitable, like QON and the Y, you know, we're always trying to do stuff for the community and I think people get that, you know, so they know we're, they come here and they want to give because we're giving back. Um, the, one of the most satisfying things is that we have the people from like Segretown and Cambridge and Edinburgh and Venango, local people that come here and, and appreciate what we're doing. If you're a regular, it means you're a regular. And I just came up with something the other day that, you know, it's kind of like, it's corny, but it makes sense because we're on a farm, but, you know, we're farmily, you know, like, got a family, farmily, you know, you it's come here too. and you feel like you're part of the family because you're in and you may not know anybody, but they'll, generally you can strike up a conversation with almost anybody in here. I'm just satisfied to have done this and this was a dream I had for a long time and actually pulled it off and it's working. I mean, I, I've gotten to the point where I think that's, you know, that makes me pretty happy. My wife's happy. I got a lot of friends my old friends and new friends that are enjoying it um, and that you know because I'm happy with what we have so I don't uh, whatever happens in the future bring it on and we'll see what happens you know
Thank you all so much. Let's give it up for the boys one more time for the band.